It's called a progress trap. Have you heard of that? It's nothing new, but it's worth a wrap. Things we've developed to move fast that add to threat of system collapse. A progress trap can be techno-crack, like cars on gas, radiating gadgets, packaged snacks, or cutting-edge weapons that in seconds can blast foreign siblings in political masks. A progress trap. It's like factory farms producing vast quantities of milk and meat replete with antibiotics, hormones, ammonia, and other treats, while animals and people suffer the beats. Tweet, tweet. What's your beef? How sharp are your teeth? We're sharing knowledge on worldwide college suspicious of Big Brother's internet storage. Are we moving forward or getting slapped? What the frack? I'm an optimistic man, but it's worth assessing the cracks on the turtle's back. Is civilization the ultimate state, or is it the source of illness we can't escape? I ain't pretending to be the great light of trees, but I do believe in asking questions and adopting inventions only if they truly support our needs. Can you feel the same breeze? It's whistling past us while the continents bleed. living, thinking, mad, deadly, worldwide, communist, gangster, computer god, secret, overall plan, worldwide, living, death, Frankenstein, slavery, to explore and control the entire universe with the endless stairway to the stars, namely, the man-made inside-out planet.
for war What the hell are we fighting for? It's a tip show, it's a poor war What the hell? Welcome to the program, everyone. Uh, we want to take a minute here at the outset uh, to speak to the tragic events that happened in Orlando, Florida this last week. Uh, nobody that listens to this program needs to be reminded of the event of the tragic shooting at the nightclub in Orlando. Uh, I've spoken, those of you that know me and follow this show, I've spoken extensively about my training as a religious scholar and uh, my thoughts on what I think is going on here in in this part of the world and at least uh, a shadow of some of the things that have um, uh, really cast their horrible, horrible shadow over most of modern civilization. And uh, I've spoken and written extensively about what I've referred to as a virulent Abrahamism. Abrahamism, the family of religions that follow a deity that um, sort of after the fact has been called Yahweh. These are three religions related to each other, uh, not only geographically, but uh, theologically and philosophically. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, speaking of them in chronological order. Um, it is it is my firm belief that any system, any hegemonic system of power in the world, uh, no matter how small or how big, uh, must be subjected to constant analysis from the people that it proclaims power and authority over. Um, when we discuss whiteness um, as a ideological construct, we don't do it with the aim of uh, harming or harassing or speaking ill of every single white person. When we discuss maleness, as a construct in the world in terms of power differentials. We are not saying every man on the planet is a bad person. When we discuss Americanness and American hegemony, we are not discussing uh, that every American is a bad person. When we discuss capital um, and some of the ravages uh, hoisted upon uh, the living from the, the devastation of aggregated capital, we're not saying that capitalism itself uh, or anybody with a $20 bill or a million dollars in their pocket is a bad person. We are saying structurally these institutions um, were created to serve a certain purpose. And as the world grows and changes in complexity, as we have new, uh, very, very serious needs on the planet that affect everybody that lives here, uh, these systems need to be reevaluated to determine how well that they are serving humanity. And we get this with whiteness and with maleness and with Americanness and with capital and with guns. One of the things we don't get it with is religion for some reason. <clears throat> when I try to speak um, to this issue, uh, we get in this fractured component. We get into this notion of, uh, you know, Islamophobia. The right wing wants to blame all of this uh, on Islam, and the left rightly calls bullshit on that and wants to avoid that 
but in so doing falls into this, uh, what I think is very damaging binary thinking. I think to uh, try to pin these kinds of shootings and these kinds of attacks on Islam is uh, short-sighted. It's um, bigoted, a little bit racist, and uh, something we should avoid. Having said that, uh, a serious conversation about the effects that uh, virulent uh, Abrahamism has had on our culture, I think is something that is long overdue. The, the old story in Egypt about when one dies, they go into the underworld and eventually after several trials are brought to a place where their heart is put onto a scale. It's the scale of Anubis. And uh, if the heart is, is weighed against the feather and if the heart is lighter than the feather, uh, then the person is allowed into the afterlife. If the heart is heavier, then they are immediately devoured by a dog, uh, jackal style creature that is there. And the idea is that what have you devoted your life to? Have you devoted your life on balance? None of us are perfect vessels, but on balance, have you devoted your life to spreading um, love, harmony, connectivity, truth, and goodness? Or have you devoted your life to uh, the opposite of those things? And it is my firm belief, um, and maybe some of you share this, maybe you don't, that on balance, um, this, this family of religious traditions uh, that, that fall under the umbrella of Abrahamism uh, would have a difficult time uh, with, that, with its heart on the scale of Anubis. When we look globally um, at the ravages, uh, especially when the, the, uh, the goals of what I'm calling virulent Abrahamism um, <clears throat> come in line with uh, aggregated capital, and I'm thinking specifically of institutions like the Bank of England, the Saudis, um, Zionist Israel, uh, the Federal Reserve, um, these you know the the the, uh, the Vatican, these institutions where we have an aggregation of not only capital um, but of this entrenched patriarchal, hierarchical uh, pyramid culture. Um, not too far behind that will come a ravage of the earth, a ravage of women's bodies, a ravage of indigenous peoples. Um, and constant assault on members of the LBGTQ community. Uh, just, just a question for this week, and then I'm going to get to this week's guest. But I just feel like this, uh, this needs to be d- addressed uh, on this show. Um, ask yourself how many churches, synagogues, and mosques in the United States this weekend will use the time. I'm not talking about a moment of silence, and I'm not talking about a one-off prayer for the people in Orlando, I'm saying of of the of all of the churches, synagogues, and mosques in the United States, how many of them this Sunday and every Sunday forward uh, are going to devote themselves and their resources and their people and their influence to doing anything that they can to make sure that something like this never happens again in the United States? Right. Uh, again, moment of silence, a prayer, thoughts, fine. Right. But how many of these institutions do you think are going to devote themselves like the rest of us need to be doing to making sure that something like this never happens again? And I think if you're honest with yourself and maybe even go do a little bit of research, call around, call every church in your town and ask that very question. And when the answer comes back, and not only every church, every synagogue and every mosque, and you'll find a handful that do, but when it comes back and you realize that probably 5 to 10% or less of these institutions are going to do that, then this notion that it's the extremists, the, the, the outliers um, that are causing this problem uh, will, will hopefully fade to the background and we can start having, just like we're having on gun control and on constructions of masculinity and on all of the other systems we've built to, to enshrine power and oppress people, uh, maybe we'll start having a conversation about this one as well. I think it's long overdue and I think it's something that we as a people and as a species need to have if we intend to survive on this planet. Uh, This is not about hating a religion. This is not about blaming people that are people of faith. This is about saying what kind of civilization are we? What are our values? What do we want to be? Who are we as a people? I saw a movie a few years ago uh, called Lord Save Us From Your Followers by uh, a wonderful man actually here in Portland, Oregon named Dan Merchant, uh, who's a creative person, a, a brilliant man, and a very loving person. He made a great film about his own faith called Lord Save Us From Your Followers. And in that film, 
Uh, he, he tries to go around the country and talk to people about why there's this chasm between people who believe like he does and people who don't. And he, and he has a lot of conclusions. I highly recommend watching the film. And I think it's a beautiful and compassionate film. And in the film, he does things like goes to a pride parade here in Portland, Oregon, a pride celebration, and sets up a confession booth. But in it, he doesn't ask for gay folks to come confess their sins to him. He confesses to them about his own homophobia, about his own complacency during the AIDS epidemic, about his own gay jokes. Uh, it's a really profound kind of switcheroo, and it's a very moving scene. I've shown the movie in my religion class and in a couple of writing classes, and I cry every time through these segments. It's a very moving thing. Um, but there's a conversation he has in the film with a gentleman named Tony Campolo, who is, a, again, a very compassionate, uh, brilliant, and considered a very moderate Christian, uh, too moderate by, by many of the folks that I used to know when I was an evangelical pastor for almost 10 years. And Campolo says something interesting in the thing. He's telling a very horrific story about a gay kid who was harassed and bullied in, in his high school growing up in, I think, Philadelphia in the 50s, so much so that the kid ended up going home and committing suicide one day after one of these bullying sessions. And Campolo says, you know, he knows, he knew he wasn't a real Christian when, when that happened in his school, because if he was, he would have stood up for that kid. And it's a very moving thing, and it's a very powerful thing that he says. But right after that, he says, you don't have to legitimate somebody's lifestyle in order to love them. And I was like, well, you know, I think here is the crux of this problem because this is coming from a moderate religious or moderate Abrahamist, not just a religious person. You know, Cherokee don't talk like this, right? Uh, Unitarians don't talk like this. A moderate monotheist says we don't have to legitimate someone's existence in order to love them. And I think that's exactly what we have to do. I think if you have a worldview that says a gay person or a vegetarian or a woman or a pagan or a dwarf or somebody with fucking hazel eyes has less of a right to be on this planet than you do, or that the sovereign creator of all things is waiting to put you into a burning, fiery pit of suffering forever because of who you love. But but me personally, I love you and, and want to try to protect you. You, you, you. you don't get it both ways. I think it's time to draw a line in the sand and start making people declare. You don't get to say you love people and at the same time you believe in a deity that doesn't want them to be on the earth, that wants them obliterated, that is just waiting for them to die so he can put them into a pit of boiling fucking water. You don't get both. Right. And so we as a culture really need to start having a, a, an honest conversation about this. And I think we ignore it at our peril. We have fallen into the grips of this PC nonsense and allow ourselves to be obliterated in the process. There is not an organization on this planet that has caused more harm than virulent Abrahamic monotheism coupled with aggregated capital that is globally true and that is true locally as well, whether we're talking about opposition in this country to LBGT rights and same-sex marriage, whether we're talking about women's bodies and reproductive rights, whether we're talking about stem cell research, the teaching of science, uh, sensible uh, climate policy, the legalization of cannabis, you pick the social issue. Uh, death with dignity laws, and, you, and then go look at what the, the primary sustained, funded religious opposition is to that in this country and around the planet, and you will find your culprit. Anyway, uh, that's as political and religious as we're going to get for this show. Uh, our guest this week is Douglas Rushkoff. Boy, if he listens to this intro, he's going to wonder what the fuck I'm talking about. And uh, if I've alienated any of you listeners, I'm sorry, but I had to get that off of my chest. Uh, all love and support and hope for the victims and the families and for anybody who is a victim of hate because it's really my belief that this is a crime first and foremost against the LBGT community but behind that it is a crime against all humanity and all of the living and whatever we need to do together to move to a place where we don't keep waking up to these kinds of things I'm on board 
uh, our guest this week, you know, Douglas Rushkoff, if I can shift gears um, entirely 90 degrees for a minute, although a lot of our conversation centers on Judaism, Douglas makes a phenomenal comment midway through our conversation when he says his understanding of Judaism is that it is there to help you get out of Judaism, to transcend Judaism. Uh, that blew my mind and falls much, very much in line with uh, philosophically and ideologically uh, how I understand the religion. What we find ourselves in is a time of these oppositional and fractured narratives, these, these scripts that provide an operating system for our consciousness that somehow have become fractured, divisive, and separated from one another and separated from the living earth. Uh, and Douglas has written and spoken and made films that speak directly to this. He's a professor of media theory uh, at CUNY in New York and has written dozens of best-selling books on media, technology, and culture. He won the Neil Postman Award for Career Achievement in Public Intellectual Activity, number six in MIT's ranking of the top ten public intellectuals. And when we spoke about this, I thought it was really interesting uh, because this wasn't a ranking of, of popularity. It wasn't a ranking of people who've necessarily sold the most books or had the biggest uh, media empires. It was a ranking of intellectuals whose ideas um, were the most important, according to this MIT uh, algorithm, uh, were the most significant in uh, understanding where we are and where we're going as a species. And uh, Douglas has devoted his life to talking about this and writing about it and talking with people about it. Um, literally written dozens of books on media and technology and culture. His newest, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. Uh, argues that we've failed to build the distributed economy that digital networks are capable of fostering. Instead, we've doubled down on this industrial age mandate of growth above all. And we're going to talk a lot about that in our second segment. In the first segment, we talk about a lot of his other books, Program or Be Programmed, Corrosion. We talk about his book, Nothing Sacred, um, and Present Shock as well. He's a prolific author, a profound thinker. Um, and we are just blown away to have him on the show. I just want to say a couple of things about that. You know, we started this show uh, close to a year ago now um, with the idea of talking to people who were uh, uh, engaged in living authentic lives, doing beautiful things. Right? It's more than our slogan. It was really the mission statement of the show. We wanted to go to those places at the edges of creativity and transformation and, and examine the, the connection between those two and how people were sort of navigating those two spaces to do to do relevant things in the world. And when I first put the, you know, the idea for the show together and then had the great team come, uh, Celeste Gervich, Iris Stevenson, Mike DiNapoli, help, uh, help us get this thing off the ground. Um, we made a long list of folks we wanted to talk to. And then on that long list, we ranked everybody. And, um, you know, on the, in the top 10 of folks that I wanted to speak with was Douglas Rushkoff. I became aware of his work when I was you know, 17 years old, way back in the Paleolithic time. And when I was that shy, awkward, frumpy, self-loathing uh, little teenager, uh, if you would have told me that at this point I would be sitting with one of my intellectual heroes uh, as a peer, as a colleague, talking about all of the ways that we have both devoted ourselves to studying and understanding and celebrating and sharing uh the, the wisdom that comes to us through our work and through the communities that we love and have embraced us about about the deep connectivity of all the living. If you would have told me that I was going to have that opportunity at some point, I would have laughed in your face. Uh, and this show has afforded that opportunity. And this show exists first and foremost because of the, the labor and sacrifice of this wonderful team that I work with and uh, also because of the fact that there's listeners, right? If we could make this thing every week and put it on the internet and if nobody listened, it wouldn't be a show. And then we wouldn't get guests booked, right, who have books and things that they want to talk about because if they could see that no one listened to the show, there would be no reason for them to come on. Douglas is a very busy man uh, who, as you'll hear in the interview, had, you know, 10, 20 interviews booked that day as well. So the fact that he even took the time to come speak with us is a testament to the fact that, that this show is doing something important in the world. And that is gauged by the fact that there are people out there listening to it and that are fi that find the show meaningful. So thank you, audience, for, for being there and uh, helping a lifelong dream of mine uh, come true. I, I just don't know what to say. I'm blown away with gratitude and humility over this. I'm still on cloud nine, uh, 
over the fact that I got to have this conversation. And it was substantive, and it was fruitful, and it was too short. Uh, Douglas has agreed to come back on the show at some point, and that's going to be uh, great. We'll get him on, and I'll be able to ask him all the things I didn't even get to in this conversation. It is a wide-ranging conversation. Uh, we cover a lot of territory. He's a brilliant guy. He's a funny guy, and we sure enjoyed having him on. Uh, look, if the first part of the show, if the first part of this host intro freaked you out or bored you or confused you, this is certainly the longest I've ever talked at the beginning of a show, then my apologies go out to you. But uh, I have a professor of religious studies. I've devoted my life to studying the mythological traditions that um, humans have developed and gone to in order to make sense of and access and expand symbolic and mythological consciousness. And I firmly believe that some of these systems are better geared than others at helping us create an integrated, ecological, and sustainable new world. Uh, and to the extent that uh, any of these mythic systems can be used to help us navigate and create that new world, they are welcome on the boat, right? But to the extent that they oppose that and stand in the way and make claims uh, and judgments about how certain people and certain lifestyles and certain ideologies and certain and the, and the way people love and who they love uh, determines um, uh, the, the legitimacy of their right to exist on the earth, we have to come to the end of that thinking, folks, or it will continue to undo us. All right. We love you all. Douglas Rushkoff, uh, really on the, the top of the top of list we, of folks we wanted on the show. After this, um, you know, we're looking for Alice Walker. We're looking for Peter Gabriel. There's only two or three other folks that, that hit the level um, of a guy like Douglas in my mind and in my heart. So thank you, Douglas, for being on the show. Thank you, listeners, for making it a show. Uh, and we hope you enjoy it. All right. We will see you folks on the other side. This is your host, Andy Gervich, and our guest this week is Douglas Rushkoff. I uh, have a longer bio for you in our host intro, Douglas, but I'm going to do a short one here. If I read your entire bio, the show would be over. Um, cool. Douglas Rushkoff is author of over a dozen uh, best-selling books on media, technology, and culture. He's a professor of media theory and digital economics at Cooney Queens in New York. Winner of the Media Ecology Association's first Neil Postman Award for Career Achievement in Public Intellectual Activity. I want to ask you about that. And I want to embarrass you. Maybe this won't embarrass you. Number six in MIT's ranking of the top ten public intellectuals, Rushkoff is an author, teacher, documentarian who focuses on the ways people, cultures, and institutions create, share, and influence each, each other's values. Douglas, welcome to the show. Hi, good to be with you. My first question is, uh, what do we got to do to take those first uh, five people down off the MIT list? Oh, I'm sure they're good people. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. It was a, a list of, um, they used, you know, some social media algorithm networking map hmm. to try to figure out. It wasn't like who's the most important, but they were looking at who are the most influential hmm. intellectuals as measured, you know, by the by their various parameters. So there were some good people. You know, it was like, you know, Richard Florida, I think, was number one, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. He's the guy that did the cultural creatives thing. 
And um, David Graeber was just above me. He's the guy that wrote Debt in the thousand year, five five thousand year history. And Mm -hmm. um, so it was people, it was interesting. It was people who, um, it wasn't like the Pope or the (laughs) head of the NBA. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) You know, or the CEO of General Electric. It was, uh, the thing that was interesting. Bezos or somebody, you know. (laughs) No, it wasn't. I mean, even though they obviously have more, more influence through their decisions, it was more like, uh, to me, it looked like kind of what's on the horizon. Who's, who's speaking in in generally uh, kind of progressively about where we're going, where we're heading. Uh, So that was, it was just, it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting exercise for them to do. You know, I don't take it too seriously, but Sure, I'm pleased to just that they know who I am is is victory enough. I was going to actually ask you because a lot of times when these things come out of these rankings and these accolades, I don't know how folks like you take them and if they mean something. Maybe they increase your quote, maybe they don't, and uh, you know. But even beyond that, how how do you process or handle something like that? And it is MIT, so I know it means something more than just you know People Magazine's ranking or something. But I think the way you just explained that, I think it probably does me, uh, mean a little more because it shows that somebody's paying attention to. The quality of the work, right? Not just reach itself, but but trans- well, yeah. transformation. Yeah, I mean, to, I'm sure most people would look at the list of top ten and look at all those names and go, "Who?" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like they know they know you know Donald Trump and Ashton Kutcher, and mm-hmm. they know you know there's a it, it, fame and fame and intellectual influence might be two different things. Yeah, no but kidding. this is but it's fine. It's it's fine. It it's uh. It was just good. It feels almost more like an inside joke than uh, than an accolade, but it was it was a fun thing to get and and by some data, right? It's MIT. Yeah, so no there's kidding. some data somewhere. <laughs> you know, I'll go to my proves this. Yeah, <laughs> put it on my tombstone. You know, MIT says. You know. I want to back up uh, before we go forward, and I want to talk to you a little bit about Present Shock and some of uh, your earlier books before we maybe in our second segment uh, get into throwing rocks uh, for for a while. Um, But I just want to let our audience know uh, a funny story, at least to me. You and I were supposed to have this conversation uh, several weeks ago when you were here in Portland, Oregon, and we set it up. You were very gracious to to afford us some time with you. And then I completely blew the meeting off. I thought it was the following Friday. <laughs> so I'm yeah, at home working on, up. it's all right. Yeah. I'm at home working on, uh, you know, whatever the hell I was working on grading papers or something. And I get this email from you. Aren't we supposed to meet today? And then it was like one of those moments where my whole life flashed before my eyes. I, I was thinking about it afterwards and you know, I'm so glad you're with us today uh, and agreed to still do the interview. And I'm equally glad that I'm with us today that I decided to show up for this interview. <laughs> Um, know, we've done it. Uh, I was trying to compare it to other uh, famous blow-offs, and I read a story once about, um, have you been to Vesuvio's in San Francisco, that wonderful bar that's right next to City yeah. Lights? Uh, there's a story about how Kerouac sat there at the bar when he was supposed to drive down into Central California and meet Arthur Miller uh, and blew him off and sat there drinking instead. So I thought maybe maybe we've arrived in this business by the caliber of the meetings we blow off. I'm, I'm exactly. thinking of it that yeah, way. Well. <laughs> But appreciate you being with I'm us. I'm sure the, the the universe wanted us to meet mm-hmm. now and in this way, not face to face. I guess we would just be it would just be too much for us. Yeah, to exactly. Well, I came. I don't know if you remember. We did come down to meet you at Pals. My wife and I. We talked a little bit about oh, it. Right. And again, you were gracious. It was a cool. It was a cool meeting. Um, in no particular order, I want to ask you a few questions, and I've been dying that to ask you. I, I watched a video. Um, and again, we'll do a little hodgepodge here and then we'll jump into the book. Uh, I watched a, a great, a very moving video you did about Robert Anton Wilson, a kind of open digital letter to him um, a while back uh, after his passing. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit to that. There was something you said in it that was really moving to me. And you said of all of the of those kind of luminaries from from the day that you've had the, the pleasure and the ability to, to be around and know he was the guy that, that you most liked being around or that was, you know, the, the easiest to be around or, or something along those lines. And I was wondering if you can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the sad but true reality is, uh, you know, a lot of us write really great things mm-hmm. and and idealistic things. And if you, you know, you read someone, you might project that they're a certain kind of person based on what they've said or their contribution to the world. But, you know, you meet them and they can turn out to be kind of an asshole, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just, it's just, no, 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 it doesn't take away from their work. Mm-hmm. It just, you know, it's, 
not just a just not a person you want to be around you know and you you might spend a whole lot of effort getting to finally get into someone's inner circle and get to meet them although i guess these days in some ways it's easier to connect with people than it was in the old days all the various rungs you'd have to go through to find the right scene and get in and the right books and the right places sure but um uh, Robert Anton Wilson was really the only one of the, and I met him all. He was the only one I met who, it was just like you know Uncle Bob. You mm-hmm. know, he'd ring on the bell, come in, have a beer, sit on the couch, and it was just um, so relaxed and so real. And I think it's partly because he didn't take himself seriously. Yeah, you know, he he. I mean, in some ways, he took everything seriously and nothing seriously, right. which was part of his whole philosophy. But uh, a, a lot of the others, you know, you go into their homes. I mean, and there, I had friendships with these folks. Like, yeah. um, you know, Timothy Leary is a great example, and he was he was friendly and supportive and superlative, and he'd blurb anything anybody wrote, and he would support people's careers and do all sorts of wonderful things. He gave money to people who were starting zines, you know, who he mm. barely knew. But you know, you go into his home, and uh, it's something to deal with you know yeah. he's a powerful personality and uh he he demanded a certain kind of uh you know respect and behavior from those around him and he would ban people from the house it just you know it ended up a lot of these guys it'll end up uh feeling much more like a, a social cult or an intellectual cult around them yeah. rather than just hanging out and bob was someone you could just be with you know and it just you know the more you knew him the deeper your understanding of him and his work went as opposed to it being this kind of uh you know cognitive dissonance between okay i'm having this experience of this person but i'm still gonna like their book (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah that's really interesting and i you know it leads to a question about the the whole scene and maybe even into burner culture a little bit about people that 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 work in that realm and have these transformative kinds of ideas but because of the nature of the conversation and because it exists on the margins it's and because of human nature it's a kind of perfect cocktail to create these cults of personality and and how do we navigate that right and and i think bob was a person that didn't buy his own press in a lot of those ways as a, i'm a professor of a lot of things but of mythology and of world uh, literature and i i use his joyce criticism all the time i think it's top notch i mean there's really nothing quite like his understanding mm. of james joyce and i saw a documentary he was in about cannabis legalization and he said the funniest thing he was you know he was it was when his um illness had returned um and he was in the wheelchair and he was talking about uh you know, George Bush and his cannabis prohibition. And he was just railing at the guy and what a fucking asshole he was. And then he pauses and takes a deep breath and he goes, well, you know, he's becoming Buddha too, but the son of a bitch doesn't know it yet. <laughs> and I remember just cracking up. You were, uh, am I mistaken? You were in the room with Tim Leary when he died. Was that correct? Not at the moment. No, I was there, you know, the, the months of, of dying, but I actually had to run to, uh, some conference in Boston okay, just um, for that night. And it. I was actually only in Boston maybe, you know, 18 hours. But that was when he went. But I was the guy who from this ridiculous conference at Harvard about computers or something, mm-hmm. I was the one who called AP, the, the Associated Press, to tell them um, – and I was like, "How? Do, excuse me, how do you register a death?" You know. Wow! No kidding. It was yeah, it was interesting, but yeah. So I was the the announcer, I guess, of it. And uh, you know, moments later, the helicopters from CNN are flying over the house, and uh, it was it was a. Uh, it was a remarkable time. Yeah, it was a remarkable time. Yeah. Can I ask you about a couple of books now? Sure. I want to start actually. I said I was going to ask you about Present Shock, but I want to start with Nothing Sacred. Uh, if you don't mind, everyone asks you about uh, all of your other texts, but I think this is a neglected one sometimes, and I think people should get this book. Um, it's about, and I'd like you to maybe tell us the premise of the book, but it's about your your thoughts on Judaism and its connection, you know, to your own life and your own experience of the, of the faith of, of your, I mean, I guess of your past, but then how it connects to your understanding of media theory as well. And I wonder if you could maybe speak a little bit to that, and then I have a couple of questions for you about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I came at the subject myself on a number of different ways, but uh, I mean, I guess I was looking at the time for a, a kind of a, a philosophical or almost 
uh, intellectual framework for open source, mm-hmm. which was a really new thing at the time. Yeah. You know, how do we how do we deal with an open source medium or or an open source participatory media space where anybody can say anything and uh, you know, and, and beliefs become more fluid and everyone's perspectives are being embraced and made part of this, uh, you know, new, you know, uh, very uh, multifaceted understanding of our, our shared experience. The Cathedral and, and the Bazaar was a book that spoke to that. It did. Yeah. It did. And I, but I was looking sort of, how do we, how do we, uh, uh, how do we navigate that? As mm. people, not mm-hmm. just as, as necessarily as programmers right. or businesses. Okay. Um, so I was trying to really apply the, uh, uh, in some ways, the open source ethos of the digital era to Judaism as a way of demonstrating that Judaism had that open source ethos to begin with. And I made the argument that Judaism was less a religion than the process through which we get over religion. Mm. You know, that, that sort of calling it a religion and giving it a sanctuary and putting it on the block with all the other religions isn't really, uh, to me, isn't so consonant with the underlying uh, kind of a purpose and function of Judaism, which was, you know, for the, it, it was really made up for the, the, survivors of the death cults of Egypt who mm. had escaped, you know, and, yeah. and tried to, uh, I mean, yeah, they created a foundation myth that all these tribes are actually part of the same, you know, uh, ethnic group. But, uh, you know, more importantly, it was, a, a, it was a, a new tradition that was about literacy and participation. Mm. So, you know, when to get into Judaism, you know, instead of kind of falling back as an act of faith, or, or stating that you believe in this God in this way. I mean, Jews, you know, you do a, a B'nai Mitzvah, a bar, a bar or Bat Mitzvah ceremony, mm-hmm. which is a demonstration that you can read this text, that you can speak intelligently about it. And once you can do that, you're allowed to have a seat at the table with all the old guys and argue. You know, and that this is a, a, the, I, I was sort of writing this at a time when Judaism, institutional Judaism, was getting very afraid mm. that Jews were intermarrying and that Judaism was becoming too diffuse. Yeah. And, and they were very busy spending a lot of money counting Jews. <laughs> they would do these uh, uh, surveys. How many Jews are there? How many are left? How many more are there since the Holocaust? You know, are there less? Are, are, you know, and projecting forward and doing all this number stuff. And I was arguing, look, that's not a way to attract people, <laughs> you know, it's right. like, stay Jewish or there's not going to be any left. Right. You know, the, that what you can do is make an invitation to a, a, uh, an approach to social justice, a way of participating in making the world a better place. And that that's the real purpose of all this stuff, you know, is you, you, you know, you, you, we developed monotheism as a way of taking people's eyes and attention off idols and onto one another. You know, the, the central image in, that, that I use in the book, the, the, it's from the, from the Torah, is when the Jews are building that first ark, the Ark of the Covenant, mm. out, in the, out in the desert. They build it exactly like a, uh, the kind of ark they would have built in Egypt, except in, in the Egyptian ark, you would put a statue of the god on top of the ark, whether it's a calf or the, you know, or the, the lion or whatever the god is. Sure. And the, the god's instructing, you know, the Jews what to do in Torah. And, and he says, um, instead of putting something in the middle, leave that space completely empty and put two cherubs, one on either side of that empty space to protect its emptiness. Mm. And there between the cherubs in the empty space, that's where I'll come that's where I'll come to you. That's where I'll speak to you. And it was really interesting to me that, oh, I get it. What, what Judaism was trying to do is rather than have this concrete God you worship, it was trying to create a, an empty space for, uh, for human connection to happen. You know, and yeah. the, the purpose of the images is more to protect that space than, than, so I came up with this book. The idea was nothing sacred, that the, the process of Judaism is getting over all of the things that you hold sacred so that you can actually be with the other people, which is the only thing that you should hold sacred. I think that's really profound. Now, let me ask you, I mean, would you make a distinction there between 
um, you know, say Reformed and Orthodox Judaism. And the reason I would ask is because you talk in the book about, you know, uh, some wonderful concepts that you can elaborate on at, at your pleasure. Uh, Judaism being dedicated to media liter literacy, um, requiring community participation. And one of the things you talk about in ritual is that rituals are broken up in a way to give people a, a sort of distance from the stories. And so they, they're, they don't over literalize them and then lose their symbolic kind of living quality. Uh, and, but then you equally talk about the danger that comes from a kind of fundamentalism. And you talk about fixed narratives, which get us into these oppositional ways of thinking that come from fundamentalism. And the reason, let me just quickly qualify the question and then, and then please go off on it. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this uh, for a long time, my own work centers on this, and especially since this Orlando shooting, I've spent a lot of time recently thinking about what I've been calling, uh, you know, virulent Abrahamism, especially as when it uh, when it lines up with the with the goals of, of aggregated capital, and that's what can maybe lead us into the throwing rocks conversation later. But the question that came to me is, if we took the the heart of Abrahamism uh, and put it onto the scales of Anubis in Egypt, and and how would it weigh? Um, these these three traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in terms of their their overall uh, contribution to a sustainable uh, and ecological human balance in the modern world. And to me, religions are their algorithms, right? They're, they're these technologies for accessing and expanding symbolic and, sp and uh, mythological consciousness. And ones that, you know, for coming from this kind of Campbellian or Jungian place, ones that, that open us to the transcendence that exists behind the form um, function well in the hearts and minds of people and do create that kind of equilibrium. Ones that close um, then move from being an identification of, uh, or a religion of identification and relationship to one of worship and hierarchy. And, and then that once that's institutionalized, then we start seeing these, these kinds of problems. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to the division there, because the kind of thing you're explaining Right. Some would argue that the big three religions don't repre represent open source. They represent, you know, corporations and Microsoft and all. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. I mean, I think they start with a certain purpose and then um, either human nature or corruption takes them in another direction. Mm. So, you know, Judaism, you know, had it forbid imagery and Torah it wanted to keep everything text. So it remained sort of, you know, fungible yeah. and interpretable. You know, even the text was supposed to be written as flames. So you never saw it as set in stone, mm -hmm. but rather this living, breathing document, more like the Constitution yeah. than a, uh, a history. And Jews at the time, I mean, Torah Jews back then, they knew these things weren't literal. Sure. They knew the sons of Jacob are caricatures of the various tribes, you know, that are that have been turned into characters. They understood the uh, the the metaphor of this thing. Um, the problem is over time. I mean, in in Judaism's case, part of the problem is that. I mean, and this is where I got into all the trouble and people started to hate me, but um, that Jews in, in wanting to claim Israel as the official homeland of mm -hmm. the Jewish people, um, which is one thing, the Jews started to use uh, Torah passages as proof. So if it says this in Torah, it means that God gave us this piece of land. Right. So once you're using a transcendent document like Torah, this infinitely interpretable, uh, uh, beyond masterwork uh, uh, piece of, of, of transcendent literature, and you're saying, no, 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 this is a real estate document, this is our land claim, hmm. then you have to collapse all of that dimensionality in the document and treat it instead as sort of letter of the law, literal, um, literal truth. So once it's literal truth, then, I mean, it's so, one, it's so boring. So, oh, I get it. Now Torah is the exact chronicle history sure, sure. of these people rather than these um, uh, transcendent uh, uh, combined mythologies with all sorts of lessons. And I mean, it, the, the whole idea of, of Torah and particularly, uh, you know, Midrash, which is the conversation around Torah, mm -hmm. is that it's all sacred. Every Midrash that every person does, no matter what your interpretation is, it's still considered sacred, even if it's stupid, right. it's sacred. So, 
but we lose all that when we want to make it when we want to set it down. Yes, yeah, so you true. take you take Jesus, you mm. know, great guy, and he was saying, "Look, you Jews, you know, you're you're starting to take the law, and he's a rabbi, right? You're mm. taking the law too literally, you know. So now, if you're actually going to take the literal law, we've got to stone sorceresses to death, you know, or kill gay people, and sure, so sure. hold on, so so that couldn't be right because we're not horrible people, we're not even so it can't be literal. So let's try to, and he was using the sort of heart chakra in all this. Sure. Let's accept Judaism as a heart religion and internalize it so that you can behave Jewishly rather than needing to look up everything in terms of, uh, you know, the, the checklist of what's right and wrong. But then Christianity became, you know, what it is in America, which is again, another checklist. He's right. We're wrong. This right. He's right. Um, and then the book really of Genesis hard. becomes a, a kind of science text in response to uh, Darwinism in the 1800s as well, which is something that was never intended to be used for as well. That was another death blow, I think. Yeah. So it's, one of the things I think you're dead on, and one of the things that I uh, talk with my religion students about regularly, we use the story of uh, uh, Jacob wrestling with the with Malach Yahweh, with the angel of the Lord, and we talk about that story um, as a literal story, okay, like this happened in history. Sometime, you know, 3,500 years ago, a guy somewhere in the Middle East wrestled all night on the ground with God, mm -hmm. right? They had a wrestling match all night. And, we, you know, and I, I go into the Brokeback Mountain kind of implication there, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. why were they wrestling all night? Why, did they, why was it all night? And why did it take God that long to beat this guy up? And aren't Jews kind of badass if, if it takes God that long to fight one? And, right, we talk about all the absurd implications of the literal story. And then I ask them now, now the second thing is, how does this help you with your life? How does this help you be a better husband, a better neighbor, a better coworker, a better student, right? How do you live a, a meaningful, purpose-driven, ethical life knowing that some guy rolled around on the ground 3,500 years ago with an angel? And then they struggle to, to, to come to some meaning there, right? But then as soon as they open themselves to the symbol, what is it to struggle with God, right? What is it to wrestle with wrestle alongside and against God. I tell them the story of the, the manna from heaven story. And people, uh, you know, think uh, manna must be this delicious sourdough bread or, or something. You think bread from heaven, it, it's probably delicious, right? But what yeah. biblical archaeology shows is that this was, you might know this, this was a an insect excrement that would dry on these leaves that they found in the peninsula. And uh, this white paste that they could scrape off with a rock, add a little bit of moisture to it, and they would dry and make these cakes that were protein rich that they can eat. And they were thanking God for this, right? These dried cakes of bug shit. And so to wrestle with God doesn't always mean to wrestle against God. It means to wrestle the, the goodness out of a situation too, even if it seems very dark. And so as soon as the students can open up to the, to the metaphor, um, to the symbol, it becomes profoundly more immediate and, and alive for them. And it's, it goes against everything they've been taught in evangelical churches to overinterpret these things as, as historically true and nothing more. It literally mm -hmm. drains them of all of their blood. I don't know. Is there a question in that? Feel free to comment on that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's yeah. just, it's, it's our nature, but it's, um, you know, we do it with, we do it with everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, so now, uh, you know, uh, I've got a friend who started this um, coding platform mm. for kids called Ready. And it's a basically a drag and drop interface through which you can make little programs or games or things without knowing Java or Python. Mm. And the, the diehard orthodox code educators are sort of up in arms saying, no, no, this is terrible. Uh, Kids must learn the real code. They must learn the real thing. You know, computer science is being corrupted by these, you know, too easy, uh, uh, you know, coding light, yeah. uh, pop coding solutions. And uh, I, I kind of beg to differ. I mean, yeah, I would love if everyone had the time and energy to learn how to really code and all that. But there's a certain point. People who know code don't know the don't know chip architecture and machine language. Right. You know, there's a point at which learning how to author something and the authoring tools that we have for these new media, you know, create more accessibility and all. 
And and that's sort of the way we I think we have to look at at you know religion or almost anything is that yeah they will become democratized and when they do there'll be a simplicity to it but it's it's the obligation of the people making the tools and the translations you know for the level above them hmm. or below them depending on how you look at it to do that you know responsibly and openly and that's really uh, you know that's the responsibility of the the so-called priest class. Class, yeah. Uh, any medium or religion, the priest class has to be humble enough to realize that we are maybe specialized in one thing, and then we have to bring that specialization, not like angry alpha nerds, but <laughs> like loving, humble people, to everybody else. You know, and if we don't, then we end up with really stupid people and angry people who will eventually do these kind of populist, uh, populist revolts. Um, on some, in some cases, founded populist results, but uninformed by the uh, the intelligence they really need to enact them. That's fascinating. Uh, before we go to our first break, one more question, but just a comment on that. Um, people said that same arc, that coding argument is the same argument people made at the beginning of the electronic music revolution, right? That these aren't real musicians. This isn't real music. This doesn't count. This is an authentic art. Um, so I find that fascinating. Um, what you said about Judaism. Um, being a tool to transcend Judaism, it reminded me of, um, it's a very Buddhist concept that Buddhism is there to help you transcend Buddhism. It's this raft that helps you across a great chasm. And the first thing you do once you're across that chasm is abandon the raft. Yeah. And I mean, it was one of my main points with that book was to say, you know, I was, I was upset that, that lapsed Jews like me were getting blamed for killing this religion. Mm. And I saw you know, people like me who were not uh, spending their time, you know, worshiping in the synagogue, but were out working for the ACLU or for tax reform or to feed the hungry or the Peace Corps or American Jewish World Service, yeah. that that was Judaism in action. Hmm. And to to criticize those people as lapsed might be uh, backwards, that those people who are actually enacting social justice in the real world, helping others, feeding the the, the hungry and, and healing the sick, um, that they might be uh, m acting more Jewishly than the person, you know, sitting in the synagogue praying all day. Is that still how you feel about your Judaism? Because I think you're, you know, I think you're profoundly right here again. There's something... Uh uh, amazingly horizontal about the teachings of Torah. I think there's some 1100 references, you know, true religion is feeding the widow and orphan and things like this. And, you know, this even the accountability of, of biblical kings who harm people or, you know, or try to kill a husband and take the wife, as in David's case, the, you know, nowhere in the ancient world was a king held, a, held accountable by a, a religious prophet saying that God is, is looked upon what you've done as wicked. I mean, prior to that, a king can do whatever they want, and they were the, the, the spokesperson of God. But this profoundly horizontal uh, nature of the religion, I think, is something that you were speaking to. So where are you with your, with your Judaism now? Are you kind of in the same place since you wrote that book? I mean, I guess so. I mean, I still I look at... at Judaism as fuel, mm. you know, that you use what you need to get yourself you know, off your bum and <laughs> out in the world doing stuff. Yeah. And, I mean, it's great to have it, certainly to, to, to have gotten it as a kid, to, be, to have some of its ideals, some of its mimetic structures embedded in the way I think. Sure. I mean, that's what led me to write books like Program or Be Program, right. you know, Ten Commands for a Digital Age, sure. that, that sort of updates the Ten Commandments as commands for people to enact, mm. uh, rather than rules for people to follow or... Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the ideas, a lot of the things that have put me on the top ten list for MIT are really just, um, you know, Jewishly informed ideas of of literacy and participation, of of agency and autonomy, um, all about uh, trying to make the world a more just place. Um, but uh, I think I'm I'm doing it. I'm just less. Uh, I'm less concerned with who or what gets credit for these ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's and that that's the thing. I remember speaking to Jewish funders way back when. These guys who spend millions of dollars doing various Jewish causes, and they wanted me to 
um, come up with a uh, uh, mechanism to help uh, uh, reinvent Judaism for the 21st century. And I came up with this thing called Reboot that a lot of people have done. It's basically an open space invitation to discuss, you know, what is Judaism and what do we want it to be and to just be in charge of the whole thing cool. and remake Judaism for a generation. And I asked the guy, um, what, how would you feel if everybody in the world did every Jewish thing, followed all the Jewish commandments and sang all the Jewish songs, but didn't know it was Judaism. Would that be okay with you? And he said, absolutely not. Mm. I was like, okay, I get it then. You know, <laughs> this is another kind of brand building then at that point. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, we're going to go to our, our break here and we get back. I actually want to jump into a few questions about present shock and then spend the last of our time talking about throwing rocks. Is that all right with you? Cool. Awesome. All right, folks, you are listening to On the Block Radio. Our guest is Douglas Rushkoff, and we will be right back after these words. All good. Great. (laughs) You know. What? (laughs) My roommate's going out of town tomorrow, so if we want to come back here after Ehrlich's party. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Sure. That sounds good to me. All right. It's a date. See you then. Richard, what's wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Literally, it's all good. Come on. <laughs> oh my god. I'm sorry. Your roommates are right. You really hate spaces. No, 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 no. I don't. It's not hate. Hate's a strong word. Um, truth be told, I do have a slight preference for tabs, but that's only because I'm anal and because I prefer precision. Well,. Not to pick a fight here, but if you really care about precision, wouldn't you use spaces? Mm. But whatever. Once it goes through the compiler, it's the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, technically, yes. I guess I just I just don't understand why you, you anyone would use spaces over tabs. Like if it's all the same, well, why not just use tabs? Because it could look different on other people's computers. Tabs create smaller file sizes, all right? I, I run a compression company. Trust me, I've devoted my life to minimalizing file sizes. It's what I do. I mean, I do not get why anyone would use spaces over tabs. I mean, why not just use Vim over Emacs? <laughs> I do use Vim over Emacs. Oh, God help us. Okay, uh, you know what? I just, I don't think this is going to work. I'm so sorry. Uh, I mean, like, what? Right, we're going to bring kids into this world with that over the heads, that's not really fair to them, don't you think? Kids? We haven't even slept together. And guess what? It's never gonna happen now because there is no way I'm gonna be with someone who uses spaces over tabs. Richard! Wow, okay. Goodbye. One tab saves you eight spaces. Oh my god. Richard, what happened? Uh, I just tried to go down the stairs eight steps at a time. I'm okay, though. See you around, Richard. Just making a point. Hello, this is Tiffany Schlain. I'm a filmmaker and founder of the Webby Award, and you're listening to On the Block Radio. We are back. We are listening to On the Block Radio. This is your host, Andy Gervich, and we're speaking with Douglas Rushkoff. I wanted to ask you a few questions about uh, the book Present Shock. Uh, that was your previous book, right, before uh, Google throwing rocks with the Google bus. Uh-huh. Um, the premise of the book, for our, uh, for our listeners that don't know it, and we're going to put links to your site and to all of these texts that we talk about on our page, cool. but what's the premise of Present Shock? And then I have a few questions about it. 
I don't know. I don't know if I know the premise. I know the, maybe I know the conclusion. What's the conclusion? Um, <laughs> yeah. That's even better. Uh, well, I mean, the the, the idea, I oh. guess, of the book is that uh, you know we're living in a, uh, a a a kind of an eternal present, a, mm -hmm. a an always on reality, and and it's. Uh, Partly about technology, you know, we have technologies that have been turned towards uh, extracting value from people as attention. So where digital technologies originally would have made more time for us, you know, you can, you don't have to answer an email when it comes in, but mm. you can answer the email at your leisure was the original uh, promise of the net. Yeah. Um, we've turned it from that asynchronous medium into an always on thing that's interrupting us constantly to the point where people think that they're missing out on something if they're having fun with their friends, but don't know what the other people are doing on Facebook. Facebook at that moment. Yeah. Um, so there's that assault, that that interruptive assault. This is a state of perpetual emergency interruption where the phone is vibrating and 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 people are updating you and and you live in that in that state that only 911 operators or air traffic controllers used to have to endure. So there's that on the one hand and then there's also sort of as a society when we crossed over that threshold from the 19s to the 20s. Um, there was a weird sense that we're here now. We mm. are in the future that we'd been looking forward to for so long. You know, and the dot-com boom busted and the Y2K bug didn't really happen. And, you know, the the 2012 didn't really happen. We're just sort of here. Right. Um, and so those two things sort of combined to uh, to put us in a, a, a state of what I'm calling present shock, which is this really uh, a, an inability to make sense. We don't have narratives. We don't have stories. We don't have goals anymore. We're just trying to kind of handle the moment as it occurs. That's what you mean by narrative collapse in the book, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, narrative collapse is the idea that, you know, we don't have stories with beginnings, middles, and ends anymore. We live in a, a post-Simpsons universe where mm. we don't really care about how the story ends. We're kind of watching it moment to moment to see what's being, uh, you know, what's being satired, you know, what's being, uh, uh, what's being referenced here. We're just trying to do pattern recognition. And it's, it's on, on a certain level, it's great because it means we're not going to, we're not going to want to fight these eyes on the prize, uh, you know, ends justify the means battles. It's very hard to, uh, hold up an ideal and say, come everyone, follow me, you know, toward this great goal. You know, this is not a society where you can say, we're going to land a man on the moon and return him safely to earth. Right. And you know, it's over when they stick the flag in the surface of the moon, we don't have that sense of completion, of finality anymore. Mm. But at the same time, we it, it opens up the possibility for more bottom up, less uh, less in, in some ways less idealistic, less less ends oriented. Uh, movements like Occupy, it prepares us to deal with more chronic problems like the environment or mm, terrorism right. or poverty or hunger. Rather than thinking, oh, we're going to declare a war on hunger and beat it, we're realizing, no, this is something that we have to stay you know, consciously uh, concerned about. Right, so that's a good thing, but the negative side of that has been the kind of psychology of, of always having to be on. I was thinking about even, you know, Facebook Messenger and things tells people when you've looked at the message they've sent. And so, you know, if you don't write back immediately, they know you've seen it and haven't responded. And so, it, like, there's all these relational implications now for the digital media. It reaches into right. and that's even because that. Right, yeah. but because we're optimizing our platforms for the extraction of value from people mm. rather than the creation of value for people. You know, the point is they they want you on there. They want you paranoid. They want you um, uh, stuck using this stuff. And that's, uh, that's the relationship I'm trying to change, mm. whether it's by, you know, talking to people through present shock about, you know, you've got to... Uh, you can embrace these technologies, but you have to do it as human beings. Yeah. You know, you have to look at how are they serving you in your life or your work? Are they helping you or are you helping them? Who is programming whom? And then in the most recent book, in Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, what I'm doing is looking, is really talking largely to technology developers to say, wait a minute, have you just 
surrendered your idea to Wall Street? Have you just pivoted away from the value that you were going to create for people with that great app and mm-hmm. instead just turned into another uh, uh, you know, stock market darling? Are you just trying to extract value from people and places so you can sell your company to another level of investors, You know, which is what most of these companies are doing now? I want to pivot over to that because we only have a few minutes left with you, but one more question about present shock and then mm-hmm. we'll spend the last of our time on throwing rocks. You you said a couple of things there that were fascinating to me, this moving away from linear stories. I just was uh, looking at uh, Slavoj Zizek put a, uh, a tweet up yesterday complaining about how he, he won't become linear at anyone's request and stop asking him to do a TED Talk. He was very upset that people keep asking him to do a TED Talk, and this was the reason, is our obsession with linearity. And I don't, I mean, we could probably spend an hour on Zizek, and so I won't go into that. But Well, the reason why, I mean, the reason why you shouldn't want to do a TED TED Talk mm-hmm. is if you do a TED Talk, you're supposed to have the friggin' answer. Right, right. And you're supposed, and the whole idea of a TED Talk is here's the answer in 10 minutes or less. Mm. You know, if you could fix the world with a tweet. You know, someone would have done it already. Already, yeah. you know, it's not. It's a long process. There is no end. As long mm. as you're alive, you can keep making the world better. You can keep. I mean. Uh, and the fact that a place like TED, they won't let someone like me talk mm. at TED. Yeah. They won't let Naomi Klein talk at TED. Right. Because these are anti-corporate messages. These are messages that are saying, no, there's not a little gizmo. I can't show you the two-minute video of us making all the little starving children in India happy now. Um with our new piece of, you know, solar cell phone technology. Right. It's just not, it's just not real. Your insight real quick before we switch over Kronos time versus Kairos time. And this notion, I really think when people start thinking about their time online, not as distraction, but as time investment and realizing that our time is really the most valuable thing we have. And when we give it to these companies so mindlessly and so regularly, we really are falling into this trap. So you can maybe speak to that and then one or two questions on Google us and then we'll let you yeah, go. Yeah, I love what you say. Let's <laughs> What's explain that? Kronos, explain uh, Kronos and Kairos yeah, 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 real yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 45 that seconds. That says it right there. <laughs> in a tweet. Um, I just did it. Um, the, the, that, that, it exemplifies it in some ways. Right. I mean, the Greeks had two... Hey, you're the one that's got to get through a softball game, man. Yeah. <laughs> I got all day. They had two, uh, uh, two words for time. You know, there was Kronos, which is time on the clock. Right. You know, what time did you crash the car? It was 427. Right. And then they had this other notion of time called kairos, which meant more like readiness, the kind of time that only human beings can perceive. It would be, what time do you tell dad that you crashed the car? You know, 429? You know, there's not a time on the clock that you tell him. You tell him after he's had his drink and before he's opened the bills. It's this human understanding of time. And I I feel like what, uh, in a digital culture, we tend to think of things in terms of chronos. Mm -hmm. How much can I get done? What is the time on the clock? How much time is left? What is this? What is the duration? And we lose touch with chronos. But chronos is where human beings have their power. You know, chronos is the kind of time that only people get. Corporations can't understand it. Mm -hmm. Computers can't understand it. But human beings do. And so, so what it's, it's the underlying cycles, the, the cycles, the, the heartbeat, the day and night, the lunar cycles, the se- seasonal cycles, the, the time, the clocks that human beings have evolved hmm. to be in sync with over hundreds of thousands of years that we don't take into account when we when we attempt to use digital time or a Google calendar to organize our lives, you know, we lose touch with those rhythms. And I'm arguing that those rhythms are what make us more powerful. Those rhythms are what allow us to act in sync with one another. They're the cycles that ancient cultures understood and Aboriginal cultures still do. And they're the sorts of cycles that allow people to forge solidarity and community and uh, uh, connection to other humans. So you would, uh, you know, obviously, and you've written and spoken on this extensively, but just to to piggyback on that, then you you would step away from the from Kurzweil and and the folks that are talking about transhumanists and, and the singularity and all that, and you're saying no, <laughs> absolutely not. Well, I wouldn't step away from them. I never stepped toward them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there. I understand 
life is really hard mm. and death is really scary. Yeah. And the idea of uploading yourself to a computer and getting to live forever is really tempting. And it's in some ways easier to work toward that than making the world a better place. You mm. get to go in a nice air conditioned Google place and build a giant computer and do TED talks about the future. And, you know, there's something fun about that. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about women and stuff. Oh my right. God, you know, because <laughs> you're a machine or just get a robot girl or, yeah. you know, there, 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 there are these fantasies. Um, and I understand where they come from and they're, they're sweet in a way. Um, and I understand that, that these people, they, they're looking at the at global warming and the environment, and they understand that the human race may be doomed, and they're looking for an escape hatch, whether it's let's get yeah. 10 people off the planet and starseed Mars, or you know, let's get Ray Kurzweil's brain into Google's mainframe. Yeah. Um, but these, these folks, they look at it almost as this good and inevitable thing, that computers are going to get more complex as they learn more than we do, and then human beings will only be important in so far as we can keep the machines going. And um, that's just not a uh, that's not a perspective I can I can sign on to. I still think and call it hubris if you must, but I still think human beings are special, hmm. and that there's a that we should try to keep the planet and our civilization hospitable to humans rather than just letting us us go extinct or intentionally um, letting us uh, letting us go extinct and become replaced by the machines. Um, only because I don't. First, I don't think it's possible. I don't think machines are conscious. Yeah. I think they are. They 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 are thinking, but they're not aware. And uh, there's just some special place for us that I would like to keep. Uh, I'd like to keep going. In in throwing rocks at the Google bus, and you know, I, I would love to to go off with you on consciousness for a bit here, but we just have about six minutes left here, so I want to get into the new book. Uh, in this book, you argue that we have failed to build the distributed economy that the digital networks uh, that are, they're capable of fostering and even early on were, were proclaiming would happen and instead have doubled down on this industrial age mandate of growth above all. And you talk extensively about like Airbnb and Uber and these things and how they're not really models of this gift economy but are, are just extractive in this nature. And so I wonder if you can speak a little bit to that and, and what the premise of that book or the conclusion, <laughs> either one, uh, and, and what you're trying to say in this book. I've heard you say that it's the most important book you've you've written. Um, well, all I'm really all I'm really arguing in uh, in this book is that we still have the potential to develop digital technologies and platforms that uh, help foster a, uh, a wider distribution of prosperity. Hmm. That what we've done instead is. Uh, just confirmed, accelerated, and amplified, you know, the extractive nature of traditional corporate capitalism. Yeah. So, you know, we all know Walmart goes to a town, they use their tremendous war chest of money to sell their products at a loss, purely to drive everyone else out of business. So then everyone in that community needs to work for the Walmart in order to have a job. So now that since they're the only employer, they can hire people part-time with no benefits because it's better to have a little bit of money than none. Mm -hmm. So that the more people go on welfare, more people need social services, there's no local economy. And eventually after 10 or 20 or 30 years, the town goes bankrupt, the Walmart closes and they move to another community and yeah. do the same thing. And you know, when you look at some of the early digital companies like uh, Amazon, they basically did the same thing. They look for the low-hanging fruit, which is the book industry, and they think, oh, let's form a complete monopoly on this book. Let's undercut all the booksellers and let's, you know, drive the prices down for the authors and the publishers. Yeah, this wasn't and, a love of literature that made Bezos. No, it yeah. wasn't. And they, they, cause all they wanted to do was establish a monopoly in books so they could leverage that monopoly to move over into what's called another vertical, another yeah. industry, whether it's, you know, drones or, 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 uh, uh servers or anything Electronics else. Electronics or yeah, anything else. Right. Like. So they're using extractive corporate capitalism, the kind that's been around since the great 
great colonial empires went to the Americas and to Africa mm. and enslaved people and took their stuff and mined their land and extracted, extracted, extracted. And it requires growth. That's the only way that works. Because really what you're doing is not building a company that has any sort of sustainable market. You're building a company in order to keep selling that company. Over you sell over it to again. another round of investors and then another round of investors. You want the stock to go up so you can keep selling it. That's what happens that, with debt, right? People sell debt over and over and over right. again. Yeah. And that's really all it's about. And no one wants to create a sustainable company with actual revenue and give dividends to their shareholders or pay their workers. And that's actually Actually, the opportunity here is to create businesses that are more consonant with value creation. Mm. So you look at a company like Twitter, and on the one hand, they achieved it. You know, Twitter, a 140-character messaging app, creates enough value for people that this app makes $2 billion a year. Wow. And it, it, it's of great value to me and to you. We can tell people when there's a new episode or the podcast. I right. mean, it, it works. Only it doesn't work for the investors. They're very upset with Twitter because Twitter stopped growing. It turns out $2 billion is about all you can make with a messaging app like that. But they're not allowed to stay that way. Their investors are demanding that they grow. So they're going to have to pivot away from this great value creating service, this app, and become something else, become something that can be extractive and that can grow. And so really what I'm writing about, what I'm trying to help people see is the, the, the problem with that perspective and giving people and especially, you know, people who want to start companies or have jobs or do businesses or promote local prosperity, you know, really simple tactics that they can use, you know, to either develop a, a local currency or to turn their business into a platform cooperative that the workers own or to make a larger business more distributive and more circulatory. Um, so it's, it's kind of got, it's got clues for everyone from, you know, heads of state and, and CEOs um, down to uh, uh, economic activists who want to um, try to fight for uh, a more prosperous uh, local economy. You gave a great example uh, in our final questions here um, about uh, a pizza place in New York that, that you gave some advice to about how to, to grow their business. Can you maybe tell that example? Because I think this is such a practical example of what you're talking about. Yeah. So, you know, you take a, a, you know, say Luigi's Pizza wants to expand, you know, and they need $100,000 to move into the neighboring uh, storefront and put in a ladies room and a men's room. Hmm. You know, normally they'd go to the bank and borrow $100,000 and have to pay it back in cash. And they'd, and the bank would ultimately have an extractive function by taking money out of that community and delivering it up to their corporate uh, shareholders. You know, what what I would suggest say to the bank would be well instead of giving Luigi a hundred thousand dollars why don't you give him fifty thousand dollars based on his ability to raise the other fifty thousand dollars from his customers and you could give Luigi an app on the phone so that someone could come into the the pizzeria give him a hundred dollars towards the expansion of the restaurant and then that person will get a hundred and twenty dollars worth of pizza when the restaurant is uh, is expanded. Mm. So the the investor customer makes twenty percent on his money in a year, which is better than he's going to do. You know, was throwing his money in Smith Barney. Right. He also gets to make his community a better place. He gets to make his his main street better. He gets to increase the tax base, uh, raise his uh, your real estate value, mm. uh, uh, make his public schools better, um, and circulate money within his community rather than outside it. And the bank gets to play a role rather than just as the provider and extractor of capital, the bank gets to be a facilitator of local reinvestment. It gets to be an expert in local reinvestment, which will serve it well if, you know, if the shit hits the fan and they the, and, and people really uh, have no purpose for banks because there's no more money left. Right. Um, at, at least banks can participate. And Luigi gets to pay back only half of it, uh, of his, of his uh, money in cash and the other half in pizza, which is a lot cheaper for him. For him over so time. So just things like that promote of the circulation of value through a community. You know, it, it's a matter of thinking, for, for the banks thinking, how can we help make people rich rather than just how can we get people's money? Hmm. And that's really how all businesses have to look at this now. Are people listening to this? I mean, I've heard you, you say you've gone around the country and, and 
talked, given this message to business leaders in the tech industry and have tried to give them that, that analogy of like a fish swimming in water, you don't see the culture, you don't see the thing underneath the operating system, this economic operating system that, that, that's been in place, as you said, since the, the dawn of the industrial age. You're still thinking in those terms, and so our, it's one thing to, to get to get people, you know, Luigi to do it, but what about you know CEOs of Fortune, you know, 100 companies? Yeah, people are listening. I mean, they're listening. In some ways, they're listening too much. I want them to read a little bit. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm getting about a thousand emails a day oh, right God. now. Yeah. I'm doing. Read the I'm book, keeping, people. <laughs> It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot to, to answer. I'm doing, you know, between six and 10 interviews or conferences a day on Skype talking to these people. Um, yeah, a lot of companies are doing things. The the CEO of Chibani decided to give 10% I saw that. Of, of his shares to his workers uh, before the IPO of that, of that company. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people, you know, listening to these ideas and willing to... Uh, to try to do stuff. I mean, between, you know, governments and uh, politicians and CEOs, there's a great willingness because the CEOs are losing money. You know, they're not doing well. Um, their companies are dying. The yeah. biggest companies, you know, the corporate profit over corporate size has been going down for 70 years. That means they've got really fat. They're filled with cash, but they don't have a way to deploy it. Mm. And they're really open to hearing about these more circulatory distributive models of value creation. It's not about redistributing the spoils of capitalism after the fact. It's about pre-distributing the means of production before the fact. And businesses are coming to recognize, ah, oh, if my customers are rich, they're going to have more more money to spend, you know, and that helping them get that basic logic, um, you know, it, it's hard at the beginning, but once they get it, um, they really are on board the idea of, of making money by doing business rather than making money by scamming other business people. Awesome. The book is Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. Douglas, I really appreciate you being with us, especially with all the stuff you say you got going on. Oh, well, thanks for having me. It's, it's a awesome crazy time, me. but you know, if people are willing to listen, then you got to strike while that iron's hot, right? Do you have time to play keyboard still? Are you? Do you see Genesis Fiorge much anymore? No, I want to see him so badly. I've got to make time. I mean, seeing him is a day, you know, right? Yeah. A, <laughs> so, so, uh, but yeah. Hopefully, that'll happen for you. This summer, yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much for being with us. Is there anything you want to add here at the end that we didn't say? No, no, it's all good. Uh, we'd love to have you on again down the future if that's possible. Sure. Excellent, man. Sure. Thank you. Especially when things quiet down. Yes, absolutely. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Douglas. Have Take a great care. day, man. All right. Bye-bye. You've been listening to On the Block Radio, folks. Our guest has been Douglas Rushkoff. This is your host, Andy Gervich, and we will see you on the other side. I'm on that Google, that Google, that Google, that Google, that Google, I'm on that Google, I'm on that Google, that Google, that Google, And you can find me out in Mountain View, grinding with my Google crew, up inside my cubicle, biting my nails to the cuticle, working overtime, keeping hours that aren't usual, but I can't complain because the ride here was beautiful. I'm on that Google bus, hanging with the upper crust, I left my Porsche up at the time. With my poodle pups Got on that Google bus Avoid the traffic rush High speed Wi-Fi Lots of legroom And the seats are plush I'm on that Google bus Going both ways In the bathroom Got a pair of solid gold bidet I'm on that Google bus Cashmere towelettes I'm on that Google bus Omelets and fresh baguettes I'm on that Google bus Seats back while we working Just turn up the algorithm See a hundred nerds Working on that Google bus Coffee in our Google cups I got my YouTube integrated With my Google Plus I'm on that Google bus I'm on that Google bus I'm on that Google, that Google, that Google, Google bus. I'm on that Google bus. I'm on that Google bus. I'm on that Google, that Google, that Google, Google bus. I'm on that Google bus, eating sushi at the drive-thru. Super happy that I didn't take that job at Yahoo. I'm on that Google bus. You're on Bart. I'm smelling sweet success. You smelling farts.
I got my Google ID and my Google Backstage Pass Watching Google TV on my brand new Google Glass I'm on that Google bus, flip and shout in the Google champ Bumpin' bass, not no records, do it the Google dance Google bus pass up inside my USB While I see that trolls out here wishing that you was me Haters need to go home and practice code Internet thugs keep it low Cause I'll be sitting on Google Chrome I'm on that Google bus, I'm getting Google cash Stock options, bitcoins coming out my Google ass I'm Google bus pimping and I'm working for a bonus Just left the Google Plex and the driver's doing donuts I'm on that Google bus. I'm on that Google, that Google, that Google, Google bus. I'm on that Google bus. I'm on that Google bus. I'm on that Google, that Google, that Google. And you will find me out in Mountain View. What people have to remember is that the object of industrialism wasn't to make more stuff better and faster. It was to disconnect labor from the value they created. So if I have a shoe factory, I don't want to hire expensive shoemakers and cobblers in my business. I want to go to the Home Depot parking lot, find a bunch of undocumented aliens, and pay them two cents an hour. So I'm going to teach them something. It's going to take me 15 minutes to teach them how to nail one nail into the shoe and then pass it on to the next guy. The person who understands how this all works is actually my enemy. So you fast forward to today, when we implement digital technologies, we try to do them in ways that get rid of people. We don't want employees. If you ha need human beings, well then how are you going to scale up? It has to be able to be an algorithm. You know, the easy way to think about it is when we, most, of our, our, most people's first interaction with a computer was probably a uh, telephone answering system. You know, and Sure, I understand a company has a human receptionist that's sitting there, you know, she's got a salary, she's got benefits, she's got a health plan, get rid of her, put in a computer, so people who call your company are gonna have to take a little bit more time to get through all those menus, you're gonna save a lot of money and it makes you look kinda high tech. But while you save money, Everybody who calls the company now spends more time going through those menus. You've actually created uh, more work rather than less. You've externalized the cost of your human receptionist onto everybody else. So then what do they do? Well, now they all have to get computer operators <laughs> because they have to externalize the cost to everybody else. So we all end up now spending more time and energy going through those uh, uh, the going through those menus than we did when we hired somebody, but because we're so biased against hiring, because the company's stock price will go up if it can show that it's hired less people, we end up perpetuating that system. So when we implement digital technologies in order to get people out of the way, in order to get them out of the company, we end up really killing the only expertise we have. If you're using algorithms and big data to figure out your next product line rather than designers, what's your competitive advantage? The other companies using that same data and probably hiring the same big data analytics company to figure out the future trends. So now you've been turned into a commodity. No, you've got to reverse in a digital age. What you want is the most qualified people you can find so that your business actually can differentiate itself from all of the other automated, algorithmic, nonsensical platforms out there. What consumers have to understand is that there's a value proposition with everything that they use. They have to be able, and currently they can't, they have to be able to ask themselves, is this platform creating value for me or am I creating value for it? Or is there an exchange that I'm aware of and I'm okay with? You know, do I want to run my social life on Facebook? Is this an exchange that I like? Do I like defining myself in that way? Do I like these radio buttons? Do I want to present myself to the world through this platform and I, am I okay with everything they know about me? I don't know. Am I okay with me getting my news and information through a news feed that's algorithmically optimized 
to make me click on things, to narrow and figure out who I am? Am I okay living on a platform that's using past data about me to advertise and market a future to me that I haven't yet decided to go live? If they know there's a 70 or 80% chance that I might go on a diet in a month, what are they gonna do? They start filling my newsfeed with, hey, you're looking kind of fat, something's wrong with you. And they're gonna try to steer me to be more consistent with my profile, to make me a more predictable and cooperative consumer. I guess that's okay as long as maybe it was a diet and so they're gonna encourage me to go on it, but what about the other 20% of people? What about what I might have done instead? What about that unpredictability that would have made me different from the next guy and let me innovate something, let me have a new idea, let me have a more interesting, personal, anomalous, weird life? Well, maybe I'm okay to surrender that. Maybe I want to be more like the rest of my statistical profile. But at least I should know this. At least I should know that my Google search results are different from yours. Why? Because Google wants me to do something. Google wants me to be a certain way. Google wants to help me be the real me. Um, but how do they know what the real me is? What's the algorithm they're using? And to what end? You've been listening to On the Block Radio with Andrew Gurevich. The show is produced in Portland, Oregon by Michael DiNapoli at MD Productions. Theme music by Moving the Mountain. Closing music by Jonathan Oak. Look us up on the web at ontheblockradio.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to tune in next week for a brand new episode. Previous episodes can be found on our website. Thanks for listening. Oh, you beautiful kitty kitties. Oh, look at you out there. Beauty like a bolt, light in a darkened hallway. New minds looking at this world and our lives through the perspective of apocalypse children. Standing dusty in the barren highways Standing broken before the fathers who are meant to make us whole But who only lied to us About what it meant to be a man About what it meant to be a woman